This episode is brought to you by Masks for Your Masks. That's masks, the number four, letter U, letter R, masks. Do you find that no matter what you do, you still feel underdressed in your Halloween or Mardi Gras costume? That's probably because you're only wearing one costume. At Masks for Your Masks, they know that walking around in a disguise without a disguise under it is like going to work without underwear. Yuck. Now you can go to that masquerade with confidence, knowing that your disguise will hold up no matter what happens tonight. Let's say you show up as Sexy Doctor. Then you overhear someone asking, Where's that Sexy Doctor? I want her to look at this pustious boil. Whoops. Now you're a Sexy Autochthon. Say, Sexy Autochthon, I haven't seen you here tonight. Did you just arrive? And our listeners can use the promo code REREAD, one word, to try out their newest product, Masks Over Mask Masks. It's a giant paper mache head and an oversized cape that will cover even the most elaborate sexy outfit and headpiece. Thank you, Masks for Your Masks, for sponsoring the Rereading Wolf podcast. Masks for Your Masks is not intended as a medical device. Masks for Your Masks is not a substitute for social distancing. Do not use more than three masks at once. Some users are suffocated to death in the streets due to mask over-redundancy. Warning, the following discussion is deliberately riddled with spoilers and unhinged speculation on this nearly 40-year-old book, Gene Wolfe's The Book of the New Sun. You can't read a Gene Wolfe story. You can only reread a Gene Wolfe story. Welcome to Rereading Wolfe. We'll abandon the literary artifice that this is the first time you and we have read these books. We're going to try to understand, and that means considering the books as a whole. Hi, I'm James Wynn. And I'm Craig Brewer. So I heard we try to keep these episodes evergreen without reference to the current events. But I heard (laughs) podcast traffic is down due to the coronavirus economic shutdown. But for us, Craig, it's been, if anything, the opposite. The Rag Shop chapter, it delivered the best single day of downloads we've ever gotten for an episode without a celebrity guest star. People love Asia. Everyone is in love with (laughs) Asia. Well, that's probably true. Right? Who doesn't love Ajia? <laughs> I don't love Ajia. Bothers me. Ajia is strange, and we'll get into that. Also, uh, we had we got an increase of followers on Twitter, the subreddit, Podbean, Facebook. I, I don't know if we're different because of the material or the audience. Wolf readers are a generally introspective bunch. Don't mind sitting down and listening to something for a long time. I didn't know if the general podcast listening was down just because people's commutes are gone. Yeah, that made sense. Sure. Yes, yeah, so we figured we'd do a little test and actually not skip a week in between episodes and see how it goes. And hopefully we won't overwhelm people with way too much wolfishness. And we're kind of forcing you to read, you know, two chapters at one time if you're reading along with us. Yeah, that's our very small public service during the coronavirus. <laughs> uh, we're the true heroes. <laughs> so, there's yeah, so not. much to talk about in this pre-segment, but Craig, we have to do corrections. Otherwise, people will think we're trying to bury the lead. So, corrections! So, of course, I've been cheering a full believer that Freddie King is essentially uh, Buenos Aires. I was wrong. The Guyol is the Uruguay uh, River and the city, which today is on the Atlantic coast, has crept up north, up the river, about 300 miles to within uh, 30 miles south of the city Salt in Uruguay. So that would require that the Guyol empties into the east side of the continent. And for a long time, I have said, as I explained last week, well, of course, it does just that. In chapter 31 of Citadel of the Autark, where Severian is standing on the beach of the ocean, he says, the old sun rose on my right and touched the waves with his fading beauty. And I heard the calling of the seabirds, the innumerable birds. I said, see, sun rises and touches the waves of the ocean. Ergo, the sun rises in the east over the ocean. Since Lexicon Earth's map has the Gaio emptying into the west of the continent, 
I discussed this with Michael Andre Triussi over email, and he pointed out that the map in Planet Engineering, published 10 years before Lexicon Earthus, has a much more detailed map, quote, drawn from Gene's notes, with the guile emptying into the West. But, you know, I had the text. But then Reddit commenter Lord of Atlantis referenced some text that sent me back to this book in search again. And there, in the same chapter, chapter 31, Citadel, there is the definitive text. It occurs earlier than I was looking, right after Malrubius and Triskali dissolve. He writes, Then I stood alone at the edge of the sea I had longed for so often, but though I was alone, I found it cheering and breathed the air that is like no other and smiled to hear the soft song of the little waves. Land, Nessus, the house absolute, and all the rest lay to the east. West lay the sea. I walked north because I was reluctant to leave it too soon and because Triskali had run in that direction along the margin of the sea. So that is quite definitive. Planet engineering and lexicon earthists are correct. I was wrong, and I couldn't be happier to see a settled fact in this book. <laughs> we should say, too, that this doesn't really change things or necessarily rule out, you know, the ideas that Buenos Aires is Nessus, because, mm -hmm. you know, it's still generally South American, and, you know, the lands can still change. We've got a lot of time that passes, and we know how different layers of civilizations are packed on top of each other in this right. one place, so... We see a lot of things like that. But one thing it does do is it just kind of leaves more fluidity to allow different ideas of what all is going on here, that maybe you could mix up certain parts of the world just a little bit if you wanted to, even if it's still primarily South America. Yeah. I still think it's possible that you can kind of map this whole story over South America. Marcus Gavea said that, you know, there's still a whole lot of references to South America in this story. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You could imagine that everything is essentially the same, but that the continent of South America sank in the west and raised in the east, and the Uruguay River kind of changed its course and moved a little bit to the west so that it empties on the west side of the continent. You could still have everything else the same. Theoretically, doesn't yeah. mean that it is, but you could. Anyway, so nothing's nothing has really changed like, other than that we know that the map that is in Lexicon Earthus and in Planet Engineering are actually correct. Now, if people wanted to see these maps, have you posted them somewhere? I posted that on Instagram. Okay, I posted on both, Instagram. I, the one Good. from Lexicon Earthus and uh, Planet Engineering, I posted them together on Instagram. Uh, speaking of Michael, and of corrections for that matter, I've been talking to him over email about that winged creature that Severian was flying in his dream in Baldander's bed. We called it a pterodactyl, and I think the miter of bone on its head still supports that term, although Severian does not call it a creature, he calls it a being, suggesting that it's a sentient creature that looks a lot like a pterodactyl. I've associated these beings with Abia since Severian rides one to meet with his minions. Also, Vodalus and company descend on Severian and the Autark riding them. Michael disagrees with me at almost every conclusion. <laughs> he doesn't think it's a form of a pterodactyl. He thinks it is, or inspired by, a periton, a creature from Borges' Book of Imaginary Beings. Periton has the head, shoulders, and antlers of a stag and the body of a bird. I I'm not so crazy about that one. He also pointed out that Agia calls these critters teropes or teropes. That's tarot, like a pterodactyl. Let's just call them that. Also, he doesn't think these creatures belong to Abia. He thinks Hathor is summoning them along with his other creatures. He thinks it's significant that Severian can't identify what kind of animal it is. Severian seems to have a near encyclopedic knowledge of all species of the animal kingdom, alien and prehistoric, but he can never give these a name. Michael thinks that's because these are Hathor's pets. I confess, I figured they weren't named because they were like the cat-headed women. 
that work for the Autark. They they aren't animals or aliens per se. They're maybe transformed people or something like that. Yeah, that makes sense. When Vodalus yeah. arrives at the Autark's call, by the way, and saves Severian and the Autark from the Asians, he's riding on these creatures. Michael thinks that those are all Hathor provided. When they get to the Ziggurat, Ajia tells Vodalus, this is the man, the price of service by myself and Hathor. Michael thinks that the service they were providing was these beings, these terops. He also thinks Ajia is zipping around the Commonwealth, encountering Severian in all these different places by riding these things around. There is good evidence that Hathor summoned them, which we'll get to years from now in Citadel. Not because <laughs> it's a spoiler, but because it's, you know, it's enigmatic and interesting. And, you know, that discussion just belongs there. Maybe one day you and me and Michael will sit down and just talk about Hathor's pets and how he calls them. But as I told Michael, the same passage that he references that implies these creators are summoned by Hathor also, for me, connects them to Erebus. So more thought is necessary. His discussion reminded me of how nervous I am about Dr. Talis's House Absolute play, by the way. It's like every scene needs a scholarly paper. Sean Michael Robinson chimed in on the Rereading Wolf Facebook group about our last episode on Chapter 16, The Rag Shop. He recommends Lee Berman's theory on Severian's extended family, Agia and Agilis. His theory is that Agia and Agilis are Severian's cousins, the children of his Auntie Syriaca. That's Lee Berman's theory. Craig, you mentioned this as a curiositus earthus once, but here we are talking about Agia. So, you know, heck, Sean's right. It makes sense. I'll post the link to it in the show notes. I'll, I'll make sure I post, by the way, the link to almost everything we talk about here in the show notes. Regarding Agia and Berman's theories, and I suppose our speculation about Agia, Sean is he's claiming ground right now. He says, myself, I find any theory which diminishes the enjoyment of the actual surface plot to be suspect. I prefer to think of Agia as what she appears to be, a poor and conniving shop owner living in a fallen and diminishing time. To me, that's the most interesting of the stories available. Well, Sean, I definitely get that sentiment. Although you might not find a lot that you agree with about what we, particularly I, say in this chapter coming up, there is is, however, a facet to all this that agrees with you. In fact, not in this chapter, but in the next one, and maybe the one after that, I can't remember, I note that Agia and Severian's conversation and interaction, stripped of any sidelong conspiracy imaginings, is so pleasing, I'm inclined to accept them as all there is. However, for me, Agia is the way Severian described Gerloise. Every little thing about her is absolutely perfect, but none of those parts fit together. Not her claimed background, not what she knows or what she does, or, and this is a big one for me, not Asia as a literary artifact in this story. Not just her place in the little Ennead tableau, but the way she, you know, after showing no fear of smilodons and dinosaurs, box at a snake. As we go on in this, I hope you'll tolerate it all, Sean, as part of the process of turning over every stone and saying, <laughs> what's this? Is this anything? What do you think, Craig? Is this anything? I don't really have a specific angle on Asia. As Craig knows, I have maybe four or more theories about Asia, and they all undermine each other. I don't think it makes any sense that she is who she says she is or quote unquote revealed to be. Yeah, I remember when I first read Borsky's stuff, I mean, he has some crazy ideas about Asia that go way further, I feel like, even than what we're talking about sometimes. Um, but I was surprised because when I first read the book, I was just fascinated with her as the character who just changes so much, right? From just a common little <laughs> crook all the way to the single-minded, focused, 
revenge-seeking Agia that she is. But when you really start to look at some of the details that Wolf adds in there, she's just really strange. And there are a lot of things that are, are hard to add up a little bit. And we'll talk about some of those tonight. We talked about them earlier and other things that will come up later. You know, and all these odd things, whether it's like the little pictures that she draws when she and Agilis are in jail, or when Agilis is in jail, right. um, that just make it seem like she's got some other odd history, too. Or why would Heather be so fascinated with her or infatuated with her all those kinds of questions just make it seem different and sure those could have just been things that wolf was adding in to make her mysterious or just add some you know depth or or just odd things about character but it really does seem like he's suggesting that there's more about her that we should be thinking about because you know some people might think that that extreme change she goes through and that single-minded focus is maybe too much of a leap and if she has a different story, then maybe it explains that a little more. I mean, you can be if both of those ways are possible to look at her. So, yeah, I can definitely see both sides of that issue. Yeah. 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 When she's riding along in that cab and they're talking. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> and and it works so well on its own. I think maybe maybe we should talk about this later, but I think Wolf has isn't going to have the reveal about who she is for a long time. And he's making that character, as we understand her, just as interesting as possible. But I think I think she has a disguise over her disguise over her disguise. And I don't really know what it is. I don't know what her angle is. I don't know how she fits into any larger picture, but I will be very surprised if I discover that she's just a little shop girl who is a con man. And Aji is not the only thing Sean is skeptical about, Craig. He and also Patrick Chesney both posted to, in part, establish that they are quite skeptical of the first Severian theory. But they both enjoyed the episodes and subsequent conversations surrounding it. Sean's post considers William Makepeace Thackeray's introduction do his first collected edition of Vanity Fair. That novel was originally written and released in serial form, as were many of Dickens' most famous novels, incidentally. But anyway, that introduction in Thackeray's novel indulges in an extensive metaphor about the writer as a performer and ends with a comparison to Thackeray's characters as puppets in a puppet show. Patrick, on the other hand, considers the listener theories about Severian's up-down confusion in the water. He sees this as an issue of buoyancy, in that to a being of the water, up and down might very well be reversed. So Patrick says, Thus, the Baldander's puppet ascension at the end of the puppet show isn't necessarily inconsistent with what happened. Baldander's fell toward the surface of Lake Deaterna from the Undine's perspective, to fall towards the surface would actually look like rising. Uh, that's very insightful interpretation of the Puppet Show dream. Yeah, I like that. That's very true. And it does also seem like something that Wolf would know. I mean, you could say it's very clever, but it's clever on his part and clever on Wolf's part. Um, I also just like that before we'd been talking about that as kind of disorientation when they go underwater and it's very getting fused, confused, but instead maybe it's just a different orientation yeah the only thing is it doesn't address and no one can say anything completely comprehensively so you know maybe patrick does have the an idea of how this fits but it doesn't address the similar feeling the theorizers noted when severian climbs to master ash's last house patrick also thinks it's a mistake to take these dreams too literally anyway he says dreams are messy and don't line up 100% with reality, which is true. Despite his disagreements and skepticism, Patrick, like I said, ended his post with a really nice compliment. You really did this chapter. One of my personal favorites, Justice. That means a lot, Patrick. Thanks so much. Okay, let me put my cards on the table about these dreams and say that although I often lean toward Mark Aramini's inclination to read Wolf's dreams symbolically, I'm increasingly favoring seeing these dreams, both Severian and Baldanders, not as dreams so much as quite literal memories from Severian 
and Baldanders' previous cycle, the first Severian, the, f- the first Baldanders. And for a first Severian skeptic like Patrick and Sean and so many others, this is going to go over like a lead balloon. And anyway, I don't see a point of delving too deeply into this until Claw the Conciliator. But my working theory is that Severian's dream is Severian's dream, Baldander's dream is Baldander's dream, but they are memories prompted by their close contact with each other. So when Baldanders looks at Severian and says, now I know where those dreams that I had came from, it really was Severian's presence that prompted them, but they aren't of the Matachin Tower. So also in that thread, Mark Garamini does mention that he thinks actually that the dreams, well, this is something he talks about all the time, very convincingly, but that in Wolf, the dreams are usually very literal and sometimes symbolically literal, but still very literal about what's actually happening in other parts of the story. And that a lot of times you can actually get clues to parts of the story from the dreams. And I think that in New Sun, it isn't as big a deal because there just aren't as many dreams. And once you get to Long Sun and Short Sun, dreams are really central to figuring out what's going on. Mm -hmm. I have to admit, I still have a sort of larger world building question about the dreams. Like if, if dreams are there to show you something that's going to happen in the future, then it seems like it should somehow talk about a presumption or an assumption in the world. Mm -hmm. Like if your dream knowledge is true, then it seems like, you know, where's that knowledge coming from? Is it coming from actual, I don't know. is, Is it like a vision from God that shows you something from the future, which then might suggest that, you know, God is actually in control or some other force is actually in control. I don't know. It's just that if the dreams are actually somehow prescient, then it seems to me like that prescience has to have some mechanism in the story. Um, And maybe that's just me. Maybe I'm just overthinking it. But yeah, that's just one issue or question I sometimes have with dreams being that. Because if they're just coming from, you know, a character's subconscious, that's a different thing. But then why would they know the truth of issues? Now, it could well be that Wolf's just doing it as a literary device, just kind of giving us clues by sort of using the excuse of, yeah, people's subconscious are weird, and, and it's a way that we can kind of have, I don't know, some psychic insight into the future. It's not sure. And Wolf certainly has a freedom to do that. I just, that's one thing whenever dreams are, give you information, I always want to know where that information comes from. And maybe that's asking too much. Mm-hmm. But yeah, with New Sun, I don't think those questions really matter so much. But definitely with Long Sun and Short Sun, dreams are absolutely central. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. It definitely. Especially in Long Sun, the dreams are essentially, think of, you know, in the Bible, Nebuchadnezzar's dreams or the Pharaoh's dreams. And Mark goes about interpreting much as as Daniel or Joseph would. On the other hand, uh, short sun spoilers coming up, so skip ahead 30 seconds if that's a problem. On the other hand, on Twitter, a listener, Nicodemus, said that he was initially turned off, totally turned off by the first Severian theory. There's an implication that he didn't even listen to the second half. But Commodore Marcus Gavea's posit that the Severian we meet in the Book of the Short Sun, who meets Marin so early and seems to have a dog is actually the first Severian quote blew his mind. And now I'll go listen to the rest of the previous discussion. (laughs) And you know, that's the way it goes with these books. You, me and Michael, we spend two and a half hours pitching a theory, me really advocating for it. Someone says, "Eh, I don't think so. And then a commenter slides in something at the end of an email and, Oh, I didn't think about that. I guess it could make sense. (laughs) And that happens to me all the time, Mm -hmm. usually regarding strange and enigmatic passages. Speaking of Commodore theories, I meant to mention, but failed to do so, Anthony Giacona's Wolf source tip on his email. He said, quote, I think that Wolf may have been inspired to use a Kabbalistic Hindu cosmology for the Book of New Sun because he might have read the first chapter of Stanley Jockey's Science and Creation from Eternal Cycles to an Oscillating Universe, whose first edition was published in 1974. The Benedictine monk scientist 
published numerous works on the history of science. He attempts in that book to list the contributions of each religion culture in the world to the discipline of science. He contends, of course, that it could only flourish in Christian Europe. But nevertheless, each culture contributed something important to it. The first chapter is on India and the contributions of Hindu, Jain, Buddhist scientists, philosophers, and the religions themselves. Also, speaking of podcast listening, I was listening to the Eating the Fantastic podcast with Scott Edelman. Edelman goes to lunch with people at cons and records his conversations with people over lunch. And in this case, he had a really long and interesting conversation with the writer-reviewer Michael Durda, mostly about book collecting and book hoarding, something I can really get into. Coincidentally, as I listened, I was boxing up books from my study these I get rid of, these I'm storing away until I can afford to build a big giant study onto my house. It could happen. Anyway, near the end, the two hour, 20 minute mark specifically, Durda discussed his lunch with Gene Wolfe shortly after his review with Wolfe's short story collection, Endangered Species. Durda gave it a favorable review, but he told Gene, man, some of these stories are impenetrable. An assertion to which Gene objected. <laughs> Gene. It's not criticism. It's an intervention. <laughs> Mark and my conversation about the books of the Long Sun and Short Suns got a recommendation from the Hoof and Hide blog. I remember this Earthlister starting his blog. I didn't know, as I learned from this blog post, that he did it and named it Hoof and Hide after the Short Sun characters, Horn's twin sons, that he had only read Wizard Knight and the books of the Long Sun and Short Sun once each. He'd never read. Book of the New Sun. So Severian and Typhon were mostly unknown to him. I'm sure as an earth lister, he was basically aware of their pertinence in that book. Now he has a lot more wolf reading under his belt, and he says that our discussion inspired him to crack Long Sun, Short Sun open again. Good news. Again, you can find a link to the, his post. Gosh, how long has his blog been going on? 10 years? It's been going on for a long time. Yeah, 10, 15 yeah. years. Yeah. Yeah. On the rereading Wolf podcast subreddit for the last episode, chapter 16, listener Goon Hands reminded us of the Lexicon Earthus second edition association of these Lambrican murders to the thuggy robber assassins in 1930s India who would rob people by strangling them with a noose or handkerchief. Interestingly, they murdered people this way, apparently because in Indian law, you could not face death for murder if you didn't spill blood. Um, I admire the attempt. He, he got it, like I said, from Lexicon Earthus, but I can't find any connection between thuggies and lambrequins. They, they strangled with a cloth, to be sure, but you know, a lambrequin? But this is a good point to bring up something that you told me about the other day that really kind of got me excited. Yeah, that's just as I was doing the final editing, where in all of Nessus might someone find a lambrequin? Assuming there isn't a lambrequin unlimited nearby. <laughs> Perchance, would you find an article like that in a rag shop? Curiositas Urthus. This chapter is called The Rag Shop, but Severian doesn't actually enter the rag shop until the very end, which reminds me of chapter 22 that is entitled Dorcas, although the only appearance of Dorcas in that chapter is in the last sentence when she grabs Severian's hand underwater. But we don't know this on the first read, but most of the chapter is about Dorcas. Severian spends the bulk of his time talking to Dorcas's husband, who has been looking for her body for 40 years. I propose that this title is appropriate for this chapter because Agia and Agilus are the murderers of this man. With a lambrequin from the rag shop, I am now the winner of Clue. <laughs> yeah, and it could also be that he was the owner of the rag shop, and now they are the owners of the rag shop, 
by default after this little event. That Maybe. is my other, that is my unsupported theory. Now, I, you could say, oh, when Severian says there's people around these towns that know this art of killing people with a rag shop, you could say, oh, well, that's Aji and Agilis, so, you know, supporting their business. But then if they have a business like that, why do they need to have a regular system where they connive people into these dangerous duels as well? Yeah. But I do like it, though, just because it does connect that dead body to something else something. that's really going on <laughs> in the story. Because otherwise, it's it's extreme. It's window dressing. It's right, extreme yeah. window dressing. But it's really just kind of there to set the stage of Nessus. I had a long, interesting discussion with Goon Hands about Mark and my discussion about the Long Sun, Short Sun. And once again, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Dr. Evil, 1380, has his own Catherine theory. I won't do it harm by trying to summarize it, but there's a link. And now we're finally going to do some shopping in the rag shop. <laughs> yeah. Chapter 17, The Challenge. So. Well, one thing I think is kind of weird, and, and this is something we should mention about Wolf's chapter titles, about how many times he'll name a chapter one thing. But then you don't actually get a lot of detail about that thing until the next chapter, which is just weird. I don't know what that really means, but like the last chapter is called the rag shop. We don't actually get inside the rag shop until now. And in fact, most of the chapter is them breakfast. having breakfast. Right. So, and, and he does that with other things where a chapter will be called, um, you know, a character's name and that character just shows up right at the end. So, well, that's yeah. Yeah. Th a lot of times the answer to the chapter comes at the very, very end. But in this case, the the challenge comes you know, right, square right in, the middle. in the middle of it. Yep. Let's jump in. So the last episode, Severian meets Agia outside the rag shop. He's looking to buy a cheap mantle to cover his fulligent cloak. Unlike most people, she's not thrown off by the presence of a Carnifex. In fact, she initially admires his cloak and then offhandedly his sword but doesn't make a big deal of it. She sends him into the shop to find a mantle or blanket or something. He enters. There's apparently a bell that jangles on the door to announce new customers. I always note bells and clanging mm -hmm. to, based on a personal theory about the text that we'll get into one day. Severian thinks no wonder a torturer didn't bother her because upon entering Severian supposes he sees behind the counter, a corpse standing there in fulfillment of the morbid wish of some past owner. And <laughs> now we're all caught up. The shop is floored with worn and uneven tiles. Surprisingly, the corpse moves and looks at him. And then it says, very fine. Very, yes, very fine. Your cloak, Optimus. May I see it? Now, Craig. Yes. I think you're right that Severian encountering Asia outside the rack shop was a setup. They already knew he was coming because this is Agilis, Agia's twin brother. I'm, I'm making finger quotes as I say that. <laughs> and Agilis is also the least perturbed by Severian's uniform. He also does not address the sword of which they are apparently experts, but only his cloak. Right. And we're going to find out that one possible reason for that that could explain pretty soon is that it seems that they work in a kind of costume shop. Um, he did call it a rag shop, but it seems that they have lots of things that, that people can disguise themselves in in different ways or a clothes shop. I mean, I, that's my assumption after reading this and we can talk about it when we get to the details, yeah. but that it was. Yeah, it was more of a costume shop. And so eventually that's one reason why you could say, oh, that's why they're not too put off by this, because they're used to seeing people in costumes and maybe they think, oh, this is just another guy in costume. Whether or not that's the case. Yeah, these are the first two people that they meet where Severian is not at all threatening. And it's it, that could just strike him out as weird. It could also mean that Severian should have perked up a long time before that and wondered why. So, uh -huh. yeah. So that's that's sort of the, the weird situation here. And then especially when you go into a shop where assuming I would think you'd be wanting to buy something. And the first thing that's happening is the guy is saying, oh, your clothes are very nice. You know, he doesn't even <laughs> say anything. He doesn't address Severian. It's like he addresses his cloak more than anything. 
else. Yeah, but she, Aja, when she first meets him, she says, oh, can I see your cloak? And then only after does she look at her sword. But mm-hmm. she says, go on in. And she immediately goes into costume. She plans to have him killed. And I mean, they have a whole elaborate plan. Right. To kill and take. He, she doesn't assume that that sword is a piece of costume jewelry. Right. She right. assumes that that's a real sword. Right. And if so, she knows that it's a Carnificial sword. And exactly. if so, she knows he is a Carnifex. Yeah. I mean, that she doesn't think he's in he's in costume. He's in costume. No, that's true. That's true. But no, and we don't. We know too absolutely that in the the end of Lost Loves, um, we find out that you know Agia has been here many many times, which is kind of the final confirmation that they've done this whole plan over and over and over again, taking someone to the Sanguinary Fields to steal their mm-hmm. stuff. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. So Agia knows the game as soon as he comes in. In fact, there's uh, we'll get into it, but. I think that there's a sign that he would like not to go through with this plan. Mm, he would rather, he would rather just buy the sword, mm-hmm. but even that is complicated. So let's go ahead and, and talk about okay. that. Um, Severian records that quote, a slash of red sunshine alive with swarming dust stood stiff as a blade between us. This is at least foreshadowing. Of mm-hmm. what's going to happen in a few chapters, uh, a few hours for Severian, and for us, Craig, about five months away. <laughs> As a reminder, it is still the day after Severian left the tower and Citadel, exactly two weeks since Holy Catherine's Day. Mm-hmm. Severian approaches Agilus. To him, Agilus is still just an animated corpse. Agilus says only, your garment, Optimate? Severian takes the tail of the cloak in his left hand and offers it to him. Like Gene Wolfe, I think Severian is left-handed. Agilus handles the material in much the same way Agia did. Yes, very fine, soft, wool-like, yet softer, much softer. A blend of linen and vicuna and wonderful color. A torturer's vesture. One doubts the real ones were half so fine, but who can argue with a textile like that? A vicuna is a South American animal, like an alpaca or llama or guanaco. Vicunas and alpacas are raised for wool. A vicuna wool is longer, I think. Guanacos that are especially known for their spitting, for you fans of Disney's Aladdin out there. <laughs> Llamas are believed to have originated in North America and migrated to South America and Asia. Oh, something else I know. Like donkeys, llamas are used by ranchers to guard herds from wolves and coyotes. They Mm. both get absolutely enraged at the sight of a wolf or coyote and will (laughs) kick and bite them to death if they can. I once saw a picture on the internets of a donkey walking around with a young coyote in her mouth. Oh, wow. (laughs) That's hilarious. I had no idea. All right, cool. Anyway, vacuna, a uh, soft wool-like material. Agilus, so, so I see your point that he acts like it's just a costume when he comes in. But like I said, I he knows it's not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, no, I know, I know. And, and, he, and he didn't run, even yeah. have to, he didn't have, she didn't have to go in and say to him, hey, he, here he comes or anything. He knows what's going on. Yeah. There's one little thing, the only, there's only one small part that we'll get to the detail in a second that makes me think that, he didn't know that he was a full on torturer that maybe he's just dressed like something. Cause there is a moment where uh Severian later says, you know, a strange emotion passed over his face when it was kind of like, Oh wait, maybe you are real. Oh, okay. um, but we'll, we'll talk about that. Cause otherwise, yeah, it seems like they're already trying to steal this from him and they want the sword. Like they think right. no matter what, they think the sword is real. Yes. And yeah, yeah. maybe they don't know what he is or how he got it, but they definitely think that the sword is not a costume sword. Yeah. But my, my working theory right now is he's pretending to believe it's a costume. Mm-hmm. Let's do it. All right. So Agilus, still behind his skull mask, reaches under the counter and gets some rags and puts them on top of the counter. Might I examine the sword? I'll be extremely careful, I promise you. Severian so takes Termis Est out of the sheath. It's man skin, remember, and puts it down and puts it on the rags. Agilus bends over it without touching it or even talking. I think 
at this point, he's probably buying time for Asia to get into her gear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, Severian notices what you've been waiting for, Craig. <laughs> a narrow black ribbon that stretched forward a finger's width from the hairs above his ears. Severian has a realization. You are wearing a mask. Uh, Agius doesn't respond to that. He just, he said, he offers him four chrysos, three for the sword, one for the cloak. This is actually a key moment. Severian is effectively penniless. I'm not sure how far four chrysos could go, but that's just an initial offer. Severian could at this time sell his sword and cloak and go off and do something else. He could join the military, for example, a job where his skills would certainly be useful. He could use the money he gets here to outfit himself nicely. He'd never fight Agilus. He he would never raise Dorcas. He'd probably never encounter Vodalus and be joined to Thecla. He'd go north, bypassing Thrax. I say that, but I assume the first Severian wouldn't be done with him. So maybe only the ultimate difference would be that he wouldn't go to Thrax. He'd still encounter the Autark, who is watching for him now. Still, this is Severian's second, maybe third opportunity to make a fate-changing decision. Mm -hmm. The first and, and maybe second, not to try to free Thecla and then showing her mercy. And now this. Severian says, I didn't come here to sell. He tells Ajlis to take off the mask. Ajlis says, fine. Now watch this. He lifted his hands and the death head fell into them. Mm -hmm. So right. he doesn't have to, he has, doesn't have to undo the ribbons. He doesn't have to unhook it. It just falls off. Yeah. And that's one of those things I certainly didn't notice for a long time. Right. <laughs> when reading it. <laughs> um, but yeah, but the mask just comes straight off at his hands, which is a weird thing for a mask to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we kind of go back to that idea that we had talked about at the end of the last episode, that they're perhaps these are they're both clones of some kind of thing, then maybe they're ought they're made to have different faces and having different masks like this is you know, whatever those ribbons are or some kind yeah. of way that they can change their face for Whoever's using them. I don't know. It's oh, I kind of have a, a, a suspicion. Maybe the reason they look so much alike is because this is not the real face, not a natural face for either mm -hmm. of them. Uh, we don't, Severian never mentions ribbons on Asia, but you know, I, maybe her hair is longer. Mm -hmm. He just can't see it. He doesn't even see this really most of the time. Right until he gets really close. Right. And the other thing too, that it is just thinking of sort of guilt by association, but we've got the, the whole passage about uh, Talus wearing a, or, or being the face of a, a stuffed Fox or wearing a Fox mask. I mean, there's already been other masks that, and that um, kind of kind of suggests that he's a, like an artifact of the past is mm -hmm. what it yeah. kind of feels like to me. Yeah. Hmm. We're working on that theory. I like, <laughs> I like it right now, so I'm 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 happy to find things. But but yeah, but if nothing else, the mask doesn't come off. The way he describes it is not at all like you know pulling off a ribbon over his head right. or something like that. Yeah, Agilus's face is flat cheeked and tanned, sort of Asian featured. The tan thing, I wonder too, just because I was trying to think how often anyone is really described as tanned in mm. this world where the sun is weaker. Yeah, that's a good point, yeah. Um, and I'm just not sure. I just can't remember anything else. So that's something else I want to keep in mind. Thecla suggests that if Severian goes out in the sun, he's going to burn, which... Mm, that's true. Hmm. I don't know. That does actually seem a little unlikely, That, but maybe people are very sensitive to the sun with all yeah. this time. Severian says that Agilus's face was remarkably like Agia's, but maybe... Maybe it's not so like her that it's like looking in a mirror. Maybe maybe it is. But, but that's the way they're compared later. Agilus offers Severian four chrysos for just the sword, and then five. His last offer, but he'll need a day to raise the money. I suppose four chrysos is what he has on hand. Severian is getting annoyed. He reiterates that he wants to buy a mantle, and he puts Terminus S in its sheath. Agilus says six, grabbing Severian's arm across the counter. That's more than it's worth. Listen, it's your last chance. I mean it, six. Now, I'm going to finish this scene and then we can talk about it. 
Agilus offers a price for the sword that he says is more than it's worth. So Varian says, I came in to buy a mantle. Your sister, as I would assume she was, said you would have one at a reasonable price. And Agilus relents. He says, fine, I'll sell you a mantle, but will you first tell me where you got that sword? And this implies that Agilus does not actually know anything about Severian himself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And despite all the clues that this whole charade was cooked up in advance. He definitely knew Severian was coming and his part of the plan. Or maybe not. Maybe he didn't have the reaction that everyone has because, you know, he's simply never seen a Carnifex. But he does know about torturers, right? Mm-hmm. Because Severian explains, it was given to me by the master of our guild. And Agilus thinks, Carnifex clothes, guild? He's claiming to be of the mythical guild of torturers? Severian sees the look cross his face and he thinks Agilus doesn't believe him. But he says, oh yeah, I do, I do. But he wants clarification. What are you? Right. And before he's mentioned that, you know, what your your cloak is a torturer's vesture. So he he knows that that's it. But I still think he he assumes that he's just dressed up like one. And mm-hmm. that's why I think when it when it says there, you know, I saw an expression I couldn't quite identify flicker across his face. That's where I wonder if it's confusion or fear or something like that for him. Well, I have a certain amount of I have some suspicions about this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But and but otherwise, the other way thing, just to explain that expression as something he couldn't quite identify, that's a weird that's a weird way to put. Well, yeah, no, he, but I think he, he does kind of explain it. He's it was it's not that he didn't believe him. It just is a crazy thing to say. And, he, mm-hmm. and he's saying, oh, well, this all makes sense now. Yeah. Right. But it's impossible it, because, in fact, he nods and says it's like encountering a psychopomp, yep. a, a psychopomp literally means a soul guide. It's it's a being that guides souls to the afterlife. So mm-hmm. so Charin the ferryman is a psychopomp. Uh Valkyries are psychopomps. I, I didn't know it was specifically a title for Hermes, the Roman Mercury. It's, that's interesting. In some cultures, a shaman is a psychopomp, but given Agilus's reaction, I don't think that's what he meant. Agilus goes on. Can I ask you why you're in this quarter of the city? You may, but it's the last question I'm going to answer. I'm on my way to Thrax to take up an assignment there. Thank you, he said. I won't pry anymore. I don't have to, really. Does that just mean I don't really have, I don't have much reason to? Like, I don't Perhaps he means, perhaps he means that Agia will get all the information about him anyway. (laughs) First question. Why is Agilus, if we believe him, even considering offering a price for the sword that is more than it's worth? He seems desperate. Like, I don't want to have to murder you. Help me help you. If their goal is to obtain the sword for profit, why would he consider offering him an unprofitable value? Now, I've theorized that Agia and Agilus are tools of Hathor rather than the other way around. I have further postulated that Hathor is not working for the Megatherians, but is actually working for the first Severian to help the second Severian along. Now, I'd say this scene seems to be evidence that I am wrong. The goal of the plan is not to obtain a valuable sword for profit, but merely to get Severian to part with it. That this is a crucial act that would lead Severian to putting away being a torturer early, would end ultimately in Severian not bringing the new son. So all this is a desperate ploy to stop Severian from succeeding, uh, akin to Erebus's desperate act in Citadel of the Autark of sending the whole of Asia, children and old people, to attack the Commonwealth in a final desperate push to capture Severian and change the course of time, to shunt the current timeline into a more favorable one from the Megatherian's perspective. Mm -hmm. So, given that I can't see what the motive is for the first Severian to plan a desperate ruse to buy the sword, this is strong evidence to me that Hathor is working for the Megatherians, or at least that Agilus and Agia are at this moment. Hmm. Yeah, that definitely works. 
for that for that theory that that's good good evidence right yeah. there for that if there's there might be a simpler one that that avoids the sort of the higher theories that I think we should just throw out there which is this that maybe it's it could just be easier if he could get him to sell it now then they could do that and then maybe have him killed later and get the money back you know it's mm. that could oh, be part of it too yeah okay um, could be but yeah but you're i think you're right that the point that of, of him trying to when he knows which i'd never thought of before yeah but the the fact that there's a whole scam that they're gonna go through that they've done many times to get everything off this guy and he's all of a sudden for some reason right here trying to get him to just sell the sword now uh, mm-hmm. yeah that's i'd honestly never noticed that before so yeah he does seem to be a desperate to obtain the sword mm-hmm. by purchasing it it does seem he would rather not opt for the plan of trying to kill him yeah but you're right maybe it is easier to get the sword in hand and then you know kill him later i don't know mm-hmm. you know there's always lambrequins so <laughs> Okay, second question. Sorry, that that just hit. (laughs) (laughs) Second question. Let me say to start that it does seem to me that this plan was cooked up well in advance. Otherwise, nothing about it makes sense. But if this is a plan, how do they arrange this to know exactly where Severian will be walking by? Maybe the reason Agilis is wearing that mask is because he just broke into the rag shop and tied up the owner. But, you know, we'll never hear about that if it happened. And yet, Agilis doesn't know who Severian is exactly, what mm-hmm. he is or anything really yeah. about the sword, because it is self-evidently designed as a head-chopping sword and nothing else. But his questions about Severian imply that he doesn't know anything about what his clothes designs actually imply, even though he does know about the Torturer's Guild as a matter of legend, but he doesn't seem to know about any greater, higher plan. Yeah, and it could be too that they they just wait for any optimate to come by, and in fact they call him that, right? They, optimate yeah. is how he addresses. Yeah, addresses him as optimate. That maybe they, maybe every single day they you know they they challenge an optimate and chop. But, but I have a question about that because Agilus knows that there's a plan A and a plan B. He knows that buying the sword is the only hope of not having to murder Severian that evening. He knows that Agia is moments away. And by the time she's done, they'll know everything about him. He can just get these pieces fit together. Like I said, despite their claims, Agilus doesn't seem to know much about swords or who their mark is, despite clearly having planned this in advance. It would be crazy, I think, to plan to take just any mark with this scheme because, well, first of question, they know a lot about swords, but have we seen their extensive sword collection? How are they so knowledgeable about swords that they would recognize the maker of this one by looking at the hilt? Mm -hmm. The whole plot seems designed to only catch Severian because, I mean, would anyone but an absolute naif fall for this ridiculous stunt? It only works with inside knowledge that Severian has just left the tower just the day before and knows nothing of the outside world. The the plan does not scale. It could be. And uh, there might be another way, though. The the only other thing I'm thinking of, because this is how I've always thought of it before, is that they that Agia Agia and him want the cloak basically that the one big thing that they think is valuable is the cloak and they're used to apparently selling cloth um in fact the first thing that he does when he goes inside is wants to feel his cloak and Mm -hmm. and is very fine and then for their plan to work maybe you know they're going to go off and get an avern which is a weird flower and maybe if he can get the sword off of severian then it's easier when aji is you know Mm. dragging him all over town then he doesn't have another weapon on him i suppose that could be something uh, because that's what i used to think before they just want to separate him from the sword Mm -hmm. to make him an easier mark yeah Well, I'm really curious to find out what listeners' opinions are about this. If this plan is hokey and seething with hidden agendas under hidden agendas, as I think, oh, well, there's your mask on a mask, right? <laughs> uh, uh, let's get let's get to that. Yeah, we have an after that's that's how this little part ends. Yeah. So. Yeah. So Agilus goes on. He says, Now, since you'll want to surprise your friends when you take off your mantle, am I right? It ought to be some color that will contrast with your vesture. White might be good, but it's rather dramatic color itself and terribly hard to keep clean. What about a dull brown? 
again, everything about this Agilis encounter does feel like it sports the idea that he doesn't know anything in particular about Severian or the reality of the situation. He supposes or pretends to suppose that the purpose of the mantle is to show up at a party and voila, here's my torturer's outfit. This suggests that he doesn't know or wants Severian to think he doesn't know how people naturally react around a torturer. Now, he says this even though Severian has already established that he is not an armiger in costume on his way to a fancy dress party. He is an actual torturer, at least a carnifex. And and Agilus is acting as if he doesn't aware that those are real things either. Yeah. And just as a tiny thing here, just because right before we started recording, we were chatting about allegory. But if you want to say that, okay, at the beginning, Severian wears black. And then he says right at the very end that he has to wear his Argent robes, which are super white uh -huh. um, before he gets on. Well, now he's saying, oh, you don't want something white yet. You just want a nice <laughs> muddy brown. Oh, that's so Severian good. Severian may yeah. still be here in the muddy brown. So there, if you want to go over the top symbolic with things, that could be yeah. But anyway. Well, at this time, Severian says something that's interesting to him. The ribbons that held your mask, he says, they're still there. Wolf, our author, guide, and torturer, immediately <laughs> changes the scene, which yep. makes me believe that this is significant for us. Yep. It is mentioned again in the fight, right? Severian says he can see the ribbons one more time, mm -hmm. right? He does, right? When they're but in the then, sanguinary but, fields. <laughs> he doesn't demand answers when he, gets, right. when he has them right. in the cell. I'm just, I'm just making sure that he actually says that he can see him again. But and I, the yeah. reason I mentioned that is because when we were talking to Michael Andrew Ducey the other day, he said, oh, I always take this as more just Severian kind of tongue in cheek saying, I know you're still lying. To right. Something right. Then it's metaphorical. Yeah. But right. then I remembered, oh, but he says that he can see him again later on. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah. And, yeah. So uh, with his respect to Michael, whose input has been so oh, yeah. relevatory to me in this first third of the book, I don't like that theory at well, all. Well, no. And, but when he said it, part of me was like, oh, duh, that certainly could be an option. But then when I remember that it's, he mentions it again, I'm like, oh, but I don't know. I think they're literally there. So literally that's three times yeah. that he's taken note of it. So my Curiositas Earthus actually has a possible way to possibly explain them, but I'm not sure. Oh, is it, is it, is it Borsky's? Uh, it's connected to Borsky's, but it's not, it's not just Borsky's. Curiositas Urthus. Robert Borsky said that the ribbons were actually paint. He believed that Agia and Agilis were followers of the Academy of Magicians that Severian meets in Sword of Lictor. What do you think of that? That's... Mm. <laughs> well, I confess, I don't like that either. I, I think it is entirely possible that they are members of that anti-New Sun cult. That's actually plausible. And it would explain why Asia is really hunting Severian rather than for her brother's sake, whom she doesn't really seem to care a whole lot about. Mm -hmm. uh, but... To speculate that Severian can't tell a difference either in the shop or in sanguinary fields between paint and a ribbon is just eh, too much to believe. So there is another version of that that Lee Berman had mentioned back in the Earth list. Looks like in 2013, I think. But, um, but I like this and he's connecting it not necessarily to specifically those people, but to the idea that Aji and Agilis are in some part way part of a, a cult of Erebus. Um, and mm -hmm. what his thing is, is that those are very similar to, first of all, the tattoos and of those, uh, like those creatures in, mm -hmm. um, or the, the people in the, cult, in the academy, which, right. In the academy. Yep. And they wear masks too. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't yep. know that they're masks like this. I, I don't know, but they do wear them. Yep. And then there's also the point that when Severian goes to visit them in the jail, she and he are drawing something on the ground that looks like some kind of strange right. ritual exactly. list, something, you know, it's just hard to know exactly what it is. I think Borsky actually also suggested that those were some sort of signifier of a, of the cult that the, cause I think he's Severian says he sees strange drawings when he's there at that village as well. Gotcha. 
So, um, and the one other thing that he said that I thought was interesting was that, um, and I'll, I can, I suppose I can just read this partly, hope you don't mind, but Ajia is observed scratching out a depiction of a Jurupari. And this is the name for, this is the, the thing that she was drawing. This is the name for a certain South American fish whose name translates to demon earth eater and also a South American mythical monster that swallows its human prey whole so that they think they are in a cave. And that that could be foreshadowing of the Manape cave where Aja leads Severian. And that certainly could be as well. Well, another thing that I thought that was really good, I remember that Borsky noted that Severian had mentioned, yeah, th- th- I've heard about these cults and and I've heard that they live throughout the Commonwealth as well, but I never thought I'd meet one. Yeah. And so, well, Just maybe. One. One small connection that in the the same post that he mentioned that just says how Agia and Agilis might possibly be connected to Severian's family tree, but that Agia mentions inheriting a misericord at one point from her mother. Mm-hmm. This is a, a slim blade used for the purpose of battlefield mercy killings. And he makes the connection that's, an, an, this is enough, this is Lee speaking, enough for me to conclude that their mother was a pelerine though I'm not sure all would concur. And for me, that clue is since his, their mother might have been a pelerine and Severian's mother might have been a pelerine, according to when Owen, that they might be related yeah. in some way. So, well, yeah, I like the misery court. I love the misery court. I love the, um, the mother reference. I, I think that there's something about that mother. <laughs> I don't think I, no one has family in this unless they seem, they seem to matter. Mm-hmm. I mean, have you, nobody, Gerloise has no family, Palamon has no family, the Autark has no family. They, they, you never hear about them going back to visit someone, uh, you know, who else? Um, Jalinta is an orphan, Baldanders, where did he come from? Mm-hmm. Nobody has family. So when, when you mention that someone has a mother, I want to know what that means. Mm-hmm. And of course, I, I no longer believe that his mother was in the Pellerines. So that even gets more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and I feel like too, or, or, well, you had asked, like, do I think that we're supposed to be able to figure out who his mother is? And another thing, another reason that I think you are supposed to, is that it's also supposed to tell you something else about the story, because for Wolf to spend all that time talking about how Dorcas is related to him and mm-hmm. just kind of leave it at that, as if to say, hey, I had a little puzzle here in the book and I'm going to show you how to figure it out. You could be like, well, that was cute, but well, does what does that mean? Why does that have any relation to something? It certainly must lead to a bigger puzzle. And why, yeah, why does he answer that for us? He right. never answers qu- puzzles for us. Right. In Fifth Head of Cerberus, the uh, number five's name is Gene Wolf. His father, they're, all of them are named Gene Wolf. He never needs to tell us. He's laid out all the pieces there. He expects us to figure it out. And there are a lot of pieces that we could have figured out. Mm-hmm. He didn't have to expl- have it explained, which leads me to think, oh, yeah, but I didn't <laughs> I didn't give you the most interesting parts about this story. So those are those weren't answers. Those were just more clues. Exactly. So. But yeah, so we never get a solid answer to what's going on with these ribbons and if they actually are connected to the mask. Um, I remember someone wondering sometime if they were like magnets, like since the, the mask drops in his in his hands, or is mm-hmm. it more like they're magnets that hold things on? And that that certainly could be. But if so, why go to all that trouble to do that and then leave leave us hanging with Severian saying, those are still there. You know, that's, that's just a very odd way to say, Hey, they, they wear masks in weird ways. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so something is going on there to suggest that there's some other connection, whether it's a tattoo or something about masks. And we, we know yeah. that we're going to see people, the higher duels later on who wear multiple masks. Um, yes. I really doubt that Agilis is a higher duel, but. Oh, um, wouldn't that be wonderful? That no, be, no, I don't think so either. <laughs> but, but you know, they do wear masks that make them look hideous. Mm-hmm. So they have they have their they have a mask. They but they also have masks under masks. That's the whole thing. Yeah, that's the point. Yeah, is that there are there are masks under masks. That we yeah, see. it is. I I'm going to put down my marker that I do believe that Agilis is wearing a mask, and if he's wearing a mask, then Agia, Agia is wearing a mask, right? 
Yeah. And just to be absolutely clear, that is one thing that I don't think Wolf ever completely comes clean on, right? No! Unless I totally missed it. <laughs> um, unless someone else has picked up something, it's totally left just as a hanging clue. And so everything we're doing, yeah, here is all just is is speculating and theorizing and connecting. But that's one of the the things I feel like, like the the creature that Severian sees in the Man Apes cave, that come up and are referred to a couple other times, but are just literally left unmentioned. And it's different from kind of wondering if there's a conspiracy or a a, a puzzle hidden in something. To this is just straight out Wolf saying, "Here's something I'm not going to explain, and I'm going to point it out to you, and then not explain it." So, yeah, but of course the masks ha- are different. That they have to be really space agey and futuristic, so yeah. that it looks like you know that making uh, like they don't look like masks; they look like right. faces that move and and all that different from even um, Doctor Palace's uh, face and his and perhaps maybe that's one thing that since Baldanders was making his own, like I assume that Baldanders made if he's making talus, then he made his face and whatnot. And so perhaps it's supposed to be inferior technology to the kind of mask that the Hyra duels have, which completely fool Severian and make them think that they're or well, well, the, the ugly ones make him think that they're mm-hmm. ugly, but then, but he can kind of tell that they're wearing other masks. Some of the other times. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. But yeah. So masks, masks are definitely all over this chapter and the last one. Yeah. Well, I'm not cr- I mean, I admit that, Ajilis and Ajia are both wearing masks. I, I'm not totally happy with that theory. I'm not going to take it home to Mama. But I think, given all the other the, the other theories that are sitting around for about those ribbons, I, I think this one can hold its head up. I, I think so, and it, it's kind of the reason it does it is kind of starts to connect to other possibilities and other mm-hmm. theories that we have. Yeah, we've answered so many other questions about this book that I'm really hopeful that we might be able to figure this one out before we get to the end of this book. <laughs> the thing is that uh, Agilis doesn't answer Severian's remark about the ribbons and Severian doesn't have a chance to force him. After a few seconds of Agilis dragging down the boxes from behind the counters, the door jingles again as someone walks in. It is quote, a youth, a, a teenager. Severian believes this because he's little, I suppose. Mm-hmm. He's wearing an inlaid closed helmet of which down curving and intertwined horns formed a visor. He wore armor of lacquered leather, a gold chimera with the blank staring face of a mad woman fluttered on his breastplate. He's wearing gauntlets. Uh, the face of a mad woman, I've always pictured as a Gorgon face, like mm-hmm. a Medusa face. Yeah, Athena, that's kind of what I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah Athena, Aegis, the word has been interpreted to mean shield or animal skin. I, I like shield because, you know, she carried it into battle. She, they say she wore, bore it into battle instead of wore it into battle. But the thing is, it, it had a Medusa face or a Gorgon face on it, and it, it looks like a mad woman's face. Yeah. And this is an ornate thing, too. I mean, and then when the the helmet with the, the horn visor, I've always kind of had, I've imagined it different ways, but almost like teeth coming down, like horn, mm. they're horns, but almost looks like a, I don't know, like some when you close it, then does that mean the horns are all pointing down and it's like teeth closing over it? But, you know, it's it's hard for me. This is where Wolf does these things sometimes where he'll describe visual things that I'm supposed to be seeing. And then I have a really hard time <laughs> imagining what I'm <laughs> supposed to, to be seeing. But the thing to me that I think is stands out is that this is really, really ornate, mm-hmm. scary looking armor, more like costume stuff. Right. right. I mean, when well, we, maybe when we, maybe yeah. when we get, but when we get pictures of the soldiers later on, they're wearing either sort of high tech stuff like the right. the all reflective kinds of, of armor yeah. that people wear or more simpler kinds of things like once he actually gets to the front. So but oh, here okay. it's very sort of if anything, it's super ceremonial armor, but it's very, very detailed. And Severian, though, at this point, doesn't have enough experience to if it is just costume armor to tell really right. the difference between that and something else. So Agilus drops his boxes and he bows to make a, he makes a servile bow. Yes, Hipparch, how may I assist you? I, a Hipparch is an ancient Greek cavalry officer. 
uh, later Severians were referred to this character as mm -hmm. an officer of the Septentrians. Yeah. That means an officer from the north. The north is where all the fighting happens against Asia. The Septentrians is a 14th century term for regions to the north of you. It has it has an interesting etymology. Literally, it means the seven plow oxen, but it refers to the seven main stars of the Big and Little Dipper constellations. Yeah, very cool. In populated regions of the northern hemisphere, the Big and Little Dipper are over the northern horizon. So there you go. I never knew. That's pretty cool. So one thing just to notice here is how different his behavior is when this figure comes in than when Severian came in, right? Yeah. Severian, yeah. even though he calls Severian an op an optimate um, here, and it could be because this is a military guy, but in each case, you've got someone from a higher class coming in. And when Severian goes in, it's like, hey, can I feel your cloak? And when right. this guy comes in, it's all drop what you're doing and bow. Right. Exactly. Well, of course, we know that this is Agia. Well, right. Severian is inside, not haggling. She's been making a quick change of clothes. Mm -hmm. She has something pinched between her two fingers. Agilus says in a frightened whisper, take it. Yeah. Whatever it well, is, take it. <laughs> and notice too, he does just, Wolf just throws this in there, but the fingers pinched as though to give me a coin. Yeah. Okay, so, so I mean, we know what's happened before and all the significance that Severian says when he's given a coin and how it sets him, you know, having the coin mm. set him on a path to becoming something, even if he had no idea of what it was. Right. And sort of interestingly enough, what he's given here is a seed, which kind of fits all that imagery with the coin, too, of things mm. growing and, and over time becoming something else. But kids, if anyone tells you, Take it, whatever it is, <laughs> back away. This is never good advice. Severian reaches out and he accepts a shining black seed the size of a raisin. Agilus gasps. Agia in armor leaves. Severian puts the seed on the counter. Agilus squeaks and backs away. Don't try to pass it to me. <laughs> and mm -hmm. Severian says, what is it? You don't know. The stone of the Avern. What have you done to offend an officer of the household troops? Nothing. Why did he give me this? You've been challenged. You're called out. To Monomaki? Impossible. I'm not of the contending class. Uh, Monomaki means single combat. Apparently in the Citadel, only the armagers fight duels. So, But when Severian says that, you know, he's not of the contending class, he's not an armager... Agilus just shrugs, and Severian writes that it, quote, was more eloquent than words. Agilus says, you'll have to fight or they'll have you assassinated. The only question is whether you really offended the Hipparch or if there's some highly placed official in the House Absolute behind this. But really, we have no way of knowing if this is a real tradition or one that was made up for someone who had arrived from you know, the non-living parts of Nessus for, uh, for the first time. Right. The only reason I wonder if that this is, that is something on is because he, Severian has a word for it, that Monomaki just, just since he seems to know, and then he, he knows there are rules, like I'm not of the contending class, as if only the upper classes are allowed to, you know, have these formal duels or something like that. Well, yeah, he's probably heard of Monomaki, but the, of, of being a, being challenged with a seed. Oh, with the gotcha. Avern, yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And and this is where they, they're totally playing Severian the right way, right? Without mm -hmm. knowing it, probably. But but to, as, because it's that last thing, too, that, that if you've upset some highly placed official in the House Absolute, you know, if he was trying to just say something like, you know, you were, you know, oh, you may have gotten some high official mad. But, of course, with what Severian has just done, that's actually, in especially in his mind, a real possibility. And that's right. what he, he says, starts oh. to think about here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, you know, it is interesting. Severian knows that the smart thing is to throw away the seed and run. Mm -hmm. You know, er, I, I'd like to fight, but I, I have an important appointment in Thrax. But Severian thinks about Vodalus fighting off three volunteers in the Acropolis. And he says, heck no, I'm going to fight. Yeah. If you want to understand his mindset, just think of, you know, Finn from Adventure Time. Yeah. And this definitely feels a bit too like the delusions of grandeur because then he, he has that moment where 
And so I couldn't do it. Someone, maybe the autarch himself or shadow of father Aniri, right? It's like as if a little boy is saying, maybe the president is mad at me. You know? So, <laughs> yeah. you know, unlikely that that's going to, I mean, if Thecla was actually a close member of the court and they found out something, then, you know, maybe it's within the realm of possibility, right. but very unlikely still. It, no, yeah, so. exactly. Yeah, you know, it only works if you're just incredibly naive about what you may have done. And, and I'm not even sure how th this kind of thing would work as a scam in most circumstances. I mean, most people, if they were challenged and they thought there was someone out to get them and then assassinate them and they hadn't done anything wrong, they probably would just run, right? Yeah. I actually take this to be ultimately kind of some insight into into Severian's mindset because even though he he talks about it as if, oh, the Autark may be after me, I actually do wonder if part of him feels like, you know, going through with this and if I do get killed, that actually solves a lot of my problems, <laughs> you <Yeah>. know, because <laughs> he still feels guilty going off to Thrax. I mean, he's already talked about how he had that super romantic feeling of being out and, you know, being free. But the longer he's out here, the more he starts to realize he really doesn't know what's going on and how to handle yeah, no. himself. Yeah, and he doesn't so know anything. I know as you read this the next throughout in the next few chapters, there's lots of times where Severian seems to very sort of cavalierly say like, you know, and I, I didn't mind if I was going to my death. I actually kind of take him at his word at that because I think there might, it, it works to me as a possibility of this, this young guy who's just been thrown out of his home and family and has no idea what he's doing. And there, there might well be a bit of a death wish in there as just a way to, to solve some of his problems. So yeah, he kind of says that, right? Yeah. He's and like, I, I don't think it's necessarily him being really cavalier. I think it's, it's more, you know, just being terribly afraid of what life was going to be like if, mm. if he goes on. Yeah. He says, says very well, I would fight if I were victorious, he might reconsider if I were killed that would be no more than just mm -hmm. still thinking of Vodalus's slender blade. I said, the only sword I understand is this one. And Agilus says, you won't engage with swords. In fact, it would be best if you left that with me. <laughs> and Severian yeah. says, no way, creepy shop dude. Yeah. <laughs> what a lump. <laughs> yeah. But not yet another time where it could be the, all the reasons we talked about, like that's a way just to, to get it to sell or, or just to get it away from possibly threatening Asia. Yeah. Oh, that's what, you know, that, that does kind of make sense. Although if that's, once again, if that's the plan, why offer so much money? Right. Agilus just sighs, says, I see you know nothing about these matters, yet you're going to fight for your life at twilight. Very well. You are my customer. And I've never yet abandoned a customer. <laughs> Just such a weird thing to say. Yeah. <laughs> very You're hard. my customer, so I will make sure that my sister accompanies <laughs> you to your to life and death. Well, right. Yeah. Severian literally knows nothing about anything except torturing people. So he just goes along with it that there's some really some kind of shopkeeper code here <laughs> that you know you never abandon a customer, no matter what. He goes to the back of the shop. And gets a brown colored mantle. It, try this one. It'll be four aura chocks if it fits. And it fit. Severian thought, the price seemed excessive, but I paid. <laughs> he says, in donning the mantle, I took one step further toward becoming the actor that day seemed to wish to force me to become, because he's going to become an actor by the end of the day. Indeed, I was already taking part in more dramas than I realized. That is so true. Oh, yeah. In many ways. It sounds <laughs> yeah. like a line when you first read it and you don't quite know of all the, you know, it's it's funny when you read that for the second time, you're it's going to stand out like everything. Because even if you don't know exactly what the whole story is with the Hyroduels and everything else behind it, you know that there's all kinds of things working in them. And for mm -hmm. Severian to do that to say that line it is it feels kind of like a giveaway <laughs> you know like how come i didn't pay more attention to that back then but the right. way it says no it's great because it's it's one of those multi-layered things where he's talking about how yeah he's gonna become a, an actor by the end of the day he's gonna become more like this this pilgrim or this uh, you know we'll talk about the pilgrim line in a in a minute but you know more like someone going on a little bit of a pilgrimage and a religious pilgrimage 
But then, of course, there are also all the different levels of who's who's acting and who's playing out a script that's been written by someone else. Right. That keeps going on. Yeah. It's a great line. Agilus says that he has to stay and look after the shop. But to honor the shopkeeper's code, I guess, <laughs> he'll have his sister help him get an Avern for the fight. She knows about the rules of sanguinary fields, duels, and perhaps she can teach you the rudiments of combat. And then when he says that, Agia walks in from the rear and says, yeah. did someone speak of me? Speaking of acting, <laughs> right on <laughs> cue. Yeah. Did someone mention me? Yeah. Again, Severian very notes that she looks so much like her brother. I felt that they were twins. Of course, I mean, they could be twins, but they have twin names. But, you know, brother, yeah. brother and they're just brother and sister, <laughs> supposedly. Yeah. And I know sometimes you had, you and I had mentioned too how it seems like there are a lot of people who in the the list um, will often. And I think someone who had just recently been doing some artic or, or some versions had sort of portrayed Asia as Asian. Um, but there's this line here that you know strangely tilted eyes. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I suppose you could say that that's trying to be a, a nod to something like that, but it's it's hard to know. And the upturn <laughs> yeah. says that she's with her upturned nose and strangely tilted eyes. That's the one that, right. that I'm not really sure. Well, other, elsewhere he describes her as having long eyes. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, I don't know what an Asian person would say to those to those lines. But it's interesting that this is not the only time we're going to have Asian people mentioned. Right. Right. He's gonna. We're gonna have the pilot when he gets the house absolute. Mm -hmm. Yep. I don't know if there's a connection there, but. I find that interesting. The slender figure and delicate features that seemed incongruent in him were compelling in her. Her brother must have explained what had befallen me. I do not know because I did not hear it. I was looking only at her. Right. So we end this part with that same kind of thing that happened when he first saw her was that, you know, she mm -hmm. was turned around and he saw a piece of her lower back and the tan skin in the sun and it just mm -hmm. it you know lust took over and that's kind of right. what he says is going on here also interesting he says he didn't hear it um but i think he's what he really means is he didn't he didn't remember it <laughs> we, oh, we, we no. could argue about that <laughs> but that he was so distracted that he wasn't paying attention we could argue about that well and you know maybe they didn't maybe <laughs> so. they just wasn't paying attention they didn't really say anything about that yeah. so autark severian takes a break from writing a, the story for a couple of hours. We know that it's that long because he's heard the guards change twice outside the door and a watch is about an hour and a half. Now he's back at it and he's thinking about the act of writing all this. The act itself. Should he record these scenes in such detail rather than condense them? Craig, we often wonder about that with our summarizations, which mm -hmm. can only <laughs> barely be called summarizations. <laughs> we take longer to summarize them than it would just to take to read it. Yeah. <laughs> That's the point. That is very much the point. <laughs> he, Severian says, I might easily have condensed everything. I saw a shop and went in. I was challenged by an officer of the Septentrians. The shopkeeper sent his sister to help me pluck the poison flower. I have spent weary days in reading the histories of my predecessors, and they consist of little but such accounts. He gives a history from the reign of Imar as an example. And before we get into the details of that, first thing I feel like we should ask is why is it that this is the moment that he decides to have this, this little reflection here um, on the difference? Because ultimately what he's going to say is... I can tell you a lot of details of what's happening, but then everybody is going to argue about what it really means and what it shows <laughs> about my motivations, right? And this is an interesting point. Like, I often wonder, like, why did he pick this point rather than, say, the moment where he decided to give Thecla the knife, right? Because that's like the crucial turning of his life. Wouldn't that mm -hmm. be a good point to stop and say, dear reader, when you wonder about my motivations, I'm really trying to explain things to you pretty well as much as I can. Instead, he takes this point where he's just about to go off on a crazy, weird almost at times literally roller coaster of a weird adventure with some random girl. And yeah, it is a strange moment, but it's, 
this one doesn't necessarily, or does it? Does it seem like, is this a moment that we would want to ask, well, Severian, why did you go with her? Why did you follow her mm -hmm. in this weird spot? <laughs> like, does it make sense to you that this is kind of the point where he, where he asked that question? I don't have any questions about his motivation. His motivations are fine, but it is interesting to me that he interposes this really right in the middle of his in rapture with Asia mm -hmm. and he's leaving with her. That's all. That's the part of the story that this comes right in between. Mm -hmm. And I think that matters. I'm not a hundred percent sure why it matters. He says, he says he's going to try and tell all of his motivations. I have no doubt about his motivations. Mm -hmm. He's naive. But and it, there's also maybe I've always felt like there was a little bit of a joke in this where he's going to say, dear reader, I'm going to stop now. And you're going to wonder why I followed this woman. And just like all the other people will wonder why Amar did all these wonderful things when in some cases very much like I was young and she was hot, you know, and it's well, like maybe <laughs> maybe it's not his motivations that we're supposed to be wondering about. That's kind and of maybe, what that I'm he's yeah. wondering about. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's Asia. Maybe we're supposed to figure out what her motivations it could are. Be. And if if that's the case, then one thing also I feel like at the end of this passage he kind of gets to is that it's almost impossible to even know your own motivations necessarily. Mm -hmm. That when he gets to the end of it, um, that's kind of what he says. The difficulty, well, we'll get there again, but the difficulty mm -hmm. is learning that we ourselves encompass forces forces that we don't actually understand. And it's almost as if he's saying, you know, I did these things, but even I didn't exactly always understand my actual motivations. Now, and I don't think he does. Here he, he says over he, that he never does. Yeah. And that could be true from a sort of very straightforward psychological sense. Could also be true from that more plot sense if he's like, you know, and there were other things pushing me in different directions mm -hmm. um, at different times. Yeah. But I, it's, yeah, it's just, I always think it's important whenever there's an aside, especially when Severian does it, it's important to stop and, and say, okay, why here? Why now? What is this referring to? Right. And um, yeah, so we'll, we'll say more about that later. But so anyway, we're going to get to, he gives this fun little example of Yamar having kind of like a Siddhartha moment. It seems like mm -hmm. the story goes exactly. I would just read it. Disguising himself, he ventured into the countryside where he spied a Mooney meditating beneath a plane tree. All right. Now, a Mooney is a Hindi word for a holy man. A plane tree is, well, there are a lot of different trees called plane trees. But I think the point here is that a lot of plane trees are called sycamores. And in ancient Egypt, the holy sycamore was a tree that connected the worlds of the living and the dead. It stood at the eastern gate of heaven from where the sun rose every morning. And in that way, the tree is like you know, Odin's Bifrost Bridge. All right, so back to... The story. Oh, and we should all, just in case people don't remember, Yamar is, is supposedly the first autark. Right, exactly. Uh, Imar the Almost Just. Mm -hmm. I love that name. <laughs> so back to the story. Imar is traveling in disguise as autarks apparently have always done since. He sees a holy man sitting under a sycamore tree. And I do think the mythical significance matters. But let's go on. The autark joined the Mooney and sat with his back to the trunk until the sun was going down. Severian writes, until earth had begun to spurn the sun. Troopers bearing an aura flame galloped past. An aura flame is a battle standard from the French Middle Ages. During the Hundred Years' War, while the aura flame was raised, no surrenders were accepted. It's also, if I remember correctly, a word that Tolkien actually uses. Really? I don't remember that one. Oh. I believe in the battle with Gondor. I think he talks about oh. that. It could be so, trooper, so troopers go by. A merchant drove a mule staggering under gold. A beautiful woman rode the shoulders of eunuchs. So most straightforwardly, glory, money, and pleasure. And at last, a dog trotted through the dust. Imar rose and followed the dog laughing. Marubius and Triscally? Here's what I think we are supposed to pick up on. 
that this is not so much an historical event as a mythical one. Mm-hmm. This is not something that happened to Imar. This is a, a parable. It's it's actually an astronomical event. The autark is the constellation Orion. The tree is the Milky Way. Orion sits. Stars and constellations pass overhead. Th- thus, the the constellation, you know, the the mule staggering under gold, the beautiful woman on the shoulders of eunuchs, and then, and ultimately, Orion rises again, following Sirius, the dog star, across the sky. I believe that the Commonwealth is probably in the Southern Hemisphere, but Wolf favors Northern Hemisphere mythocosmology. But Severian attempts to take the story at face value, and he addresses the many interpretations of the story by scholars, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm just going to read the whole thing, because this it's, it's long, but it's kind of interesting. Supposing this antidote to be true, how easy is it to explain the autark had demonstrated that he chose his active life by an act of will and not because of the seduction of the world. But Thecla had had many teachers, each of whom would explain the same fact in a different way. Here, then, a second teacher might say that the autark was proof against those things that attract common men, but powerless to control his love of the hunt. And a third, that the autark wished to show his contempt for the Mooney, who had remained silent when he might have poured forth enlightenment and received more. But he couldn't do it by leaving when there was none to share the road, since solitude has great attractions for the wise. Nor could he show contempt when the soldiers passed, nor the merchants with his wealth, nor the woman, for unenlightened men desire all those things. And the Muni would have thought him one more such man. And a fourth, that the autark accompanied the dog because it went forth alone, the soldiers having other soldiers, the merchant his mule, and the mule his merchant, and the woman her slaves, while the Muni did not go forth. Yet why did Imar laugh? Who shall say? Did the merchant follow the soldiers to buy their booty? Did the woman follow the merchant to sell her kisses and her loins? Was the dog of the hunting kind? or such a short-limbed one as women keep to bark lest someone fondle them while they sleep. Who now shall say, Imar is dead, and such memories of his as lived for a time in the blood of his successors are long faded. So mine in time shall fade too. Of this I feel sure. Not one of the explanations for the behavior of Imar was correct. The truth whatever it may have been, was simpler and much more subtle. Anyway, Severian says that his reaction to Agio was like that. (laughs) He says, of me, it might be asked why I accepted the shopkeeper's sister as my companion, I, who in all my life had had no true companion. Uh, That is a bit emo. Severian. It is, but actually, you know, (laughs) but I'm thinking too, there's a whole passage in Earth where Severian talks about how he feels like he's been lonely his whole life. It's after he gets back out from um, Yassad and he's been healed and he's kind of having this regret for a moment, feeling like I've always been alone forever. And then he's like, but maybe I pushed everybody else away. Uh, But it's interesting that this is kind of, it does kind of have a callback here. I don't know. He's had Roche, he's had Thecla, he seems like he's never been alone. Oh, he's always had people. Yeah, I think he means sort of more like, you know, I always push other, like, you know, yeah. Dorcas ends up leaving him and, you know, he ends up walking away from, like, Gunny gets gets away from him and, right. and Jonas leaves yeah. and so, yeah, Jalenta well, dies. <laughs> the very nerve. <laughs> <laughs> and Severian says, and who, reading only of the shopkeeper's sister would understand why I remained with her after what is at this point in my own story about to happen. No one, surely. Obviously he's not talking about discovering Agia's betrayal. I guess he's talking about crashing into the Pellerine temple or maybe resurrecting Dorcas. Yeah. Or, or gaining the claw. Like why would I yeah. have stayed with her once, once I realized that she had stolen this, relic and and sort of dropped it on me that's kind of what he doesn't 
he doesn't really he doesn't know that though until after right not for a long Ajilis time is dead yeah so. not for a long time but um but i that's kind of since that's the big thing that's about to happen but they don't but he does the thing is he doesn't stay with her at that point they're separated yeah. so it has to be something before mm, that it maybe. has to be you know the, the the getting crashing into the pelerine temple maybe you know who knows yeah. what so one other thing you can do with this story is think maybe about, okay, is, is the actual Yamar story that he's talking about not just a random little story that he decided to use, but is there something about it that shines some light on what Severian's going through? And the obvious thing is that a dog trotted past, and that's when he decides to finally get up. And, and I like wondering if this is, are there things here that we can note that might be about other things that have or will tempt Severian, like the troopers who, you know, bear their their thing that Severian ultimately doesn't necessarily want to. He does, of course, become a soldier, but he it's it's a horrible situation. Um, the war is is a crazy war. Um, yeah. The merchant drove a mule, mule staggering under gold that he's offered money. Uh, there's Is there anything? I'm trying to think. There's no real moment where Severian is offered money. I mean, he, Typhon offers well, him power, but, but I well, mean, well, the Thrax, he has respectability and yeah, most money yeah. as well. I suppose that could be something like that. The beautiful woman, of course, there's a lot of those that distract him along the way. Um, and then it's finally the dog who catches him and, and takes him by and that the dog is sort of a, a friendship. So I don't know that I don't really have a good way to, to read that directly back onto Severian. But I did want to try, just since Severian is the <laughs> one who, who brought it up. I do like, though, the different options he shows the, of what these things could could mean. And, and this is also probably, I feel like, one of the first times where we're not thinking necessarily about clues, but that his recollections here about how Thecla had many teachers, that probably what he's now remembering is this is a part where he's remembering what Thecla remembers, not yes. remembering what she told her. Um, now, you're never going to really pick that up. Um, the first time. Not at this point, but, but I, th- I've always, I've come to believe that maybe all of these moments of reverie really are the Thecla in him coming out. And th- this isn't the way that Severian originally would think. Right. Yeah. No, I think that's right. I think that, that sort of going back and doing this little bit of literary criticism of like, how do different scholars look at, at this thing? That's not natural to Severian. That's maybe a little mm-hmm. bit more of, of how the learned Thecla might do. Right. So are any of the options that they talk about things that Severian later as Autark is going to have to deal with? I feel like there's something else I should be saying here about, I don't know. I feel like I'm trying really hard to to make this a sort of second level reflection on Severian's ultimate goals to sort of why it is that he's worthy of being some kind of spiritual leader, but there Mm. might not be, there might not be hidden in here um, a really good way to think about that. Cause all the explanations don't to me quite seem to, or they're that Thecla's teachers might've offered don't really quite seem to apply to Severian. So, um, you know, powerless to control his love of the hunt. Well, he does want to go fight and he is, Kind of, he still is into violence <laughs> throughout his whole life. But, but that's not, you know, I don't know. Eh. Um, you know, contempt for the mu- the Mooney who was silent when he could have helped everyone else. I mean, that is a little bit like Severian wanting to use the claw um, mm-hmm. and, and really wanting it to, to make sure that it stays there. Then there's the part about solitude. And I've always thought the one explanation there about the how he wanted to show that solitude has great attraction for the wise, so he wouldn't get up and leave with anyone else because he didn't. He wanted the Mooney to think that he was wise. That's weird. That's just a weird explanation. <laughs> but you know, I do like that. And yet, why did Lamar Yamar laugh? Who shall say? Yeah, all <laughs> these questions. And then he also says, Yamar is dead, and such memories of his has lived for a long time, and the blood of his successors are long faded. As if to say, too, that even though Severian, who probably has some memories of Yamar, um, that they are still faded and far away. Yeah, even it, within that's him. that's that's some insight, actually, that the memories of the original Artarchs do fade in the in the minds they, as they far as they become memories of memories of memories. The truth when he says that one line there, though, about the truth, whatever it may have been, was simpler and more subtle. I always wonder if that's actually true of wolf stories or not. And But I, I think it's also cool that Severian says that, but then he never actually says what he thinks. Well, I think uh, for me, the lesson here is that the experts are all wrong and they're trying to 
I hope that's not me, but you know, that sure, sure looks like it mm-hmm. as somebody who's trying to, to make a, a, a whole story out of something that has a very straightforward explanation. Could be. Yeah. Which is a difficult thing for us all as wolf readers to think that he might be saying. <laughs> because the, there's no great meaning for why he sat down or why he, he, he got up. Severian is saying that if I had told this story the way he did, then I would have just done these things and everyone would have had to put some interpretation on top of them for why Severian went into the shop, why Severian went with the shopkeeper's sister, why Severian, you know, picked the Avern and fought at the duel. Whereas, you know, there's all kinds of things that happen in between and come up. It could just be that Imar was tired. He sat down next to the Mooney and then a dog came by and he was ready to get up. Yeah. So it's the next paragraph then that really grabs me uh, because it yeah. goes away a little bit from the story. Um, and it's, so after he says, I couldn't really explain my desire for it, but then there's this paragraph and, and I'll oh, read wait, it. wait, but before we oh, read okay. that, let's talk about that paragraph. Oh, okay. That little okay. bit. I have said that I cannot explain my desire for her. And it is true. I loved her with a love thirsty and desperate. I felt that we too might commit some act so atrocious that the world seeing us would find it irresistible. This text is probably the major reason why Michael thinks that the first Severian and Asia were some kind of Bonnie and Clyde couple. And I confess, I feel like something about Asia and Severian is being conveyed. And I, I'm not sure what it is. Quite aside from all that, Severian tells us that Asia says everything with a twinkle of mockery. Mm-hmm. So, you know, she's a dry, phlegmatic character. And so, yeah, read that the next part, because that's that's equally obscure to yeah, me. Yeah, but it, it is right that that, that one part i mean because i've always thought well isn't that obvious that he's just kind of he's he's lusting for Ajia that whatever reason she just you know it's beyond a crush the man his age he's got their boy (laughs) his age he's got that that feeling of lust but then that last line about that we too might commit some act so atrocious Mm -hmm. you know it's almost like saying it's a bit of rebellious love like wanting to just you know go off and do something crazy which is why i mean i should say michael believes that that Asia and the first Severian were a couple and that they were, I don't know, criminals or something mm-hmm. t- together. They had, they had huge adventures and maybe they had become famous criminals or something like that. Could be. Could be. Okay. So the next part, next couple of bits are my favorite parts of this whole thing. So it says no intellect is needed to see those figures who wait beyond the void of death. Every child is aware of them, blazing with glories, dark or bright, wrapped in authority older than the universe. They are the stuff of our earliest dreams, as of our dying visions. Rightly, we feel our lives guided by them, and rightly, too, we feel how little we matter to them, the builders of the unimaginable, the fighters of wars beyond the totality of existence. The difficulty lies in learning that we ourselves encompass forces equally great. We say, I will, and I will not, and imagine ourselves, though we obey the orders of some prosaic person every day, our own masters, when the truth is that our masters are sleeping. One wakes within us, and we are ridden like beasts, though the writer is but some hitherto unguessed part of ourselves. So... So first, let's talk about that. What, who are the masters beyond death that he says that every child knows? Because he says that, and then you're like, what? <laughs> what <laughs> well, everything we know? Yeah, they could be, they could be gods. Mm-hmm. They could be fate. I suppose he's saying that we all understand that our lives are compelled by the people who came before, by history, by our ancestors, maybe. Especially given... What he says next about the difficulty lies that we ourselves encompass forces equally great. I don't know anything for sure, but he says that every child knows of them. Yeah. And I feel like that's where it, it could be something like instincts, like lust, like with Asia, that 
that he could this could be a sort of very complicated way of talking about, you know, passions that we feel mm-hmm. and that occasionally wake up and act on us. That's very much how Plato Plato in the Republic talks about how passions work like this, that every now and then they just take over. And, and that's sort of why they're dangerous, because they they kind of have a, a, a will of our, of their own that are different from ours. And that's certainly how he's talking about this here. It could be that. But then he also talks about, um, the, it's the, the part where he says, rightly, we feel ourselves to be guided by them, but then also how little we matter to those things. And that's the part that sounds like it's almost less about gods and more about just forces in the universe that are out there, whether they're personal forces like lust or hate or fear or hunger or something like that. But then he says that those are the fighters of wars beyond the totality of existence. And it's that little extra bit that that makes me wonder what's going on here. And honestly, I feel kind of like, just because of some other things I'm working on right now, that part of what he might be talking about are mythic stories. I mean, this gets back Mm -hmm. a little bit to some things that I know you like about the night sky. Um, But Mm -hmm. I've been wondering a lot lately about how much of Book of the New Sun is really about how certain embedded stories, you can think about them a little bit, I suppose, like archetypes or Jungian archetypes or things that are that have their own sort of dramas that we occasionally play out. I don't know, but this is a weird passage that is saying there are forces out there, whether they're gods or passions or something, that have their own logic and their own reasons for doing things. And we just happen to occasionally get caught up in them. And that's sort of sometimes the source of our motivations. And I guess the big payoff of that is in that last part where he says, you know, we think we make choices and we have desires or, or wills or things like, or not desires, but wills. Whereas in fact, what we're doing is just reacting to other things that occasionally control us. And so in the end, it's kind of like this terrifying, it's not, it's not even determinism. It's more like the kind of, it's, it's Lovecraftian horror that there are things yeah. <laughs> out there. I mean, not, not necessarily the monsters, but the, the whole horror of Lovecraft is that there are things that are so beyond our understanding that are so much more powerful than us that will occasionally come in and just destroy or completely take over your life. Yeah, I think that's this part when when he says I we say I will and I will not and imagine ourselves our own masters when the truth is that our masters are sleeping. I think he's saying uh, yeah, maybe we get to make some choices, but the big choices are already decided for us. Mm-hmm. It's just a, I I like it because it's such a not cagey, but it just it's a way of describing a whole bunch of different possibilities that doesn't necessarily turn them off. Like if you wanted to say this is a way to talk about, you know, unconscious drives and desires, it would work for that. But if you wanted Mm -hmm. to talk about it being gods, you know, almost more like, like the sort of Greek gods who are gods of of passions and forces and things like love and war that are in the world and sort of have their own logic. It could go with that. Yeah. It's just such a cool, but still to me, very enigmatic. So, but one thing I would say too, is if anyone else is, has a much simpler way to sort of condense a lot of things in this passage, I'd really like to know because there are a lot of things in this little aside that I think are really cool and that I feel like have interesting connections to the book, but it still is one of the parts of the book that mystifies me a little bit. Yeah. Like I have, I have all kinds of possible reasons why it makes sense here for him to talk about it. And as a general aside to say, Hey, look, I'm trying to explain why I did these things, but even I don't know all the reasons. Yeah. That makes sense. And he's, of course, we're going to know that he's being, manipulated by Hyraduels and the Autarchs and Father Aeneere have a conspiracy and you and I are talking about the first Severian who could be behind everything. All of those are certainly possible. Yeah, this one's this last is. sentence. One wakes within us and we are ridden like beasts, though the writer is but some hitherto unguessed part of ourselves. Yeah, that one gets pretty, that one could be on, <laughs> on the nose that's, right there. That's very first Severian, his, his past future self who is manipulating him. Yeah. And then it turns out that what he's been saying here is in his mind, sort of maybe that's an explanation of the whole Yamar story, that there are mm. all these different forces and why we decide to get up and follow the dog rather than the, the woman on the Unix or whatever. We don't really know. Yeah. Who can say? as he says. Anyway, very fun. 
I like it a lot. Yeah. I still love the. I I remember. Um, I was. I kept a commonplace book for a little while, and I had those. Uh, the two paragraphs that no intellect is needed to see those figures. I had those written. Yeah. There. <laughs> yeah. Wasn't there? There's a verse in in Jeremiah that says, it says that the the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. Who can know it? As in, you know, who can mm-hmm. know their own heart? Yeah. So. Well, then we come back, and I like how he says it. However, that may be. <laughs> I let the shopkeeper sister help me adjust the mantle. So. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Whatever my mysterious motivations were, I let her put yeah, gloves I, on me. Yeah, the, the mantle ties closely around the neck to completely hide his fulgen cloak, but he can't carry Terminus Est on his back anymore. So he just walks around with it like a staff. The sheath has a, a iron tip. So luckily, you know, it worked. Now the chapter ends with Severian thinking about disguises and perhaps reveals something about the origin of the Torturer's Guild and some Commonwealth history too. Severian says that this disguise hiding his association with, with the Guild was hardly a disguise at all. This kind of mantle originated from shepherds and they still wear them apparently in Severian's contemporary times. Then soldiers adopted them. There was a time when the front uh, against the Asians was much further south than it, than it is now in the, quote, colder regions of the Commonwealth. Mm-hmm. But they've driven them north, maybe with the help of the heroes. From the army, religious pilgrims began using them, Severian supposes, because it could be converted into a makeshift tent. So... Is Severian here saying that his disguise covering his guild clothes was no disguise because the order of the seekers of truth and penitence originated as a religious order, an order of, in a sense, shepherds of flocks or perhaps crusaders? Is it possible that when we read references to shepherds in the Brown Book, we should be reading torturers? Could be. I remember one of the first theories that really caught my attention on the Earth list a long time ago was someone who had thought that the real secret of the guild was not just that they obey, but that the secret is that this is all that's left of the Catholic Church. Mm. They could be. I don't think that would be quite that, but yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's funny how quickly all of the symbols that make him a torturer can get used for this. Like the mantle fits right over his cloak and it goes well. Terminus Mm -hmm. Est, he says it can be like a staff. It's also Mm kind of cool because since it's a sword, it's a cross, right? And Mm -hmm. it's almost like he's carrying now not just a staff, but perhaps a cross as he wanders around. But he he literally says that, you know, this really isn't a disguise Mm -hmm. at all because... Uh, and then he lists all the origins of this particular style of mantle. Yeah. And he even says that later. There's another, oh shoot, I forgot exactly what scene it is, but he decides to start to talk about himself as not a member of the tortures, but as someone from the, from the guild of the orders for truth and penitence. And it's in a moment where he's kind of talking about some religious possibly truth or something about the the new sun. Where is that? I'll have to find that part. Well, let me just say that, uh, you know, religious belief and practice has declined in Nessus. Yeah. So Severian was the only person there wearing a mantle, but presumably by this time, a mantle makes people assume you're religious. Mm -hmm. Severian says that a soft, wide brimmed hat to complete this picture. I guess that's what pilgrims wear. And Ajia tells him that he he looks a good palmer. A palmer is a medieval term for a pilgrim who has returned from Jerusalem. They carried palms, Mm -hmm. palm branches, as a sign that they had been there. She's making a joke, but for Severian, it went right over his head, and he takes it seriously. And he says that, quote, I wished I knew more of religion. And the twins think that's quaint. And Agilis says that this getup is useful for increasing your social charisma and for driving people away if you want to. He says, if you mention religion first, no one will want to talk about it. Besides, you can get the reputation of being a good fellow by wearing that and not talking about it. (laughs) When you meet somebody you don't want to talk to at all, just beg for alms. (laughs) (laughs) 
which I think is kind of a cool moment uh, because it's sort of like if if you're one of those people who feel like what Wolf is really doing is telling a whole bunch of really religious stories. And there are many people on the earth list who have always thought that, that what he's doing is really wrapping up theology and different stories in different mm -hmm. ways. This is him kind of following that idea by saying, you know what, if you just come right out and say, start religious talking, nobody's <laughs> going to do it. But if you wrap it up in disguises, like the disguise of a torturer with a really cool sword, sort of like the opposite. Like if you turn <laughs> that staff into a sword and if you turn mm, the, yeah. the, the, the mantle into actually, you know, a dark cloak, well, then people will start to pay attention right. to you. It's kind of funny. Yeah, and then, of course, Sir Severian says, and so I became, in appearance at least, a pilgrim bound for some vague northern shrine. Have I said that time turns our lies into truths? Because he is, he's going to be looking for a shrine. He's, gonna, he's soon mm -hmm. going to be moving no, ever further north looking for pelerines. Yeah, and that's the one goal that sticks with him until uh, he finally, until he gets recruited into the army. Yeah, that's the, yeah. the majority of the rest of the book, either both before and after Thrax is, is still to find, to find the shrine. Right. Um, yeah. One other thing here is that because of that word pilgrim um, in his new book, Michael Andrew Drusi talks about uh, a lot of connections with this chapter and that image uh, to Bunyan's um, Pilgrim's Progress. John Bunyan. John yeah. Bunyan. Yeah. Um, and Not the ones on your feet. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, and I think it's funny. He mentions that. Um, whenever Wolf talks about his influences, he never really mentions Pilgrim's Progress. But the Pilgrim's Progress is a, it's an allegory of really the soul's journey to salvation and all the different challenges that, that you face and how you fall down and what sin is like. And it's one, um, I know I've always been interested in people who thought that Book of the New Sun was like an allegory. Or close to it and, and and i've always i always liked that the new york times review that is on the back of most of the uh i forget if it's on the the original but it's definitely on the reprint but mentioned spencerian allegory as mm. what it's like and spence edmund spencer and the fairy queen is one of my favorite favorite old poems but it's a, a long very complicated allegory and it's it's a good allegory. <laughs> there, there's bad <laughs> allegories where everything is just kind of a code and they get really boring. Um, but I had a teacher one time who said, yeah, bad allegory is where there's an allegory of beautiful of beauty and she's just a really beautiful person. Good allegory is when the character named Beauty runs up to you, grabs a hammer and smacks you over the head. Like that's a good <laughs> allegory because it really kind of talks about how what it actually is like and, and how you can use that way of thinking for really fun things. So I don't think that this book is a straight allegory, but I definitely do feel like there are parts of it that really do kind of work allegorically. There's certainly the Brown book stories can work that way, but Spencer's allegory is famous for being a really hard to understand allegory and how some of the characterizations change over time. And there's actually a point in there where one character becomes an image of jealousy who starts off as a regular character and becomes a creature named jealousy and goes off and lives in a cave because he, he <laughs> loses all his money. Anyway, I'm also convinced that that is where where Tolkien might have gotten a little bit of Gollum, but so that's a that, that's a paper to be written. <laughs> but Mal, Mal, <laughs> Malbecco turning into to Gollum or to jealousy is one of my ideas. But yeah, there are a lot of things about the book that I feel like can work on that a little bit more straighter allegorical level if you want to. So the fact that Michael mentions Pilgrim's Progress is really good, and that that could be. I don't know if this is a direct nod to that, but. I certainly think there are places in here where you can look at the story as kind of the development of, if not towards full salvation, like Pilgrim's Progress is, definitely the development of someone having more spiritual insight or moving from unknown evil to a much more moral standpoint. And you can kind of map out some of his events or some of his episodes as very much like stages on a kind of spiritual progress. So right. I just yeah. like that. I don't know that that's necessarily the best way to read the book, but I really like that it kind of lends itself to that. Yeah. But yeah, that last line that time turns our lies into truth. 
Um, <laughs> that's, well, that actually connects to all kinds of things that have gone before, like like Vodalus's coin and the whole point about symbols, about how you know he takes on the symbol, and I don't really know what it means, and I'm not a soldier now, but in time I'll become that. It's kind of connecting back to that early discussion that we kept having about symbols. I remember once in a online discussion, somebody asked Wolf, why do so many of your characters tell lies that become the truth? And he said, I don't know. I guess I'm hoping my lies will turn into the truth. (laughs) All right. Well, there's the challenge. So at least this chapter was actually about the challenge. Um, It did come right in the middle. Well, next we're going to get into the craziness of Severian's adventures. And this is the part of the book where I think sometimes a lot of people will start to get lost because, you know, so far up to this point, we've had, you know, Harry Potter for torturers. And then all of a sudden he gets out into this world where people are trying to take advantage of him. There's crazy Talus and Baldanders who we have no idea what they are. They're there for a while and then they disappear. There's a, you know, action chase scene that happens it's very confusing and a lot of weird things yeah. happen in the i mean chapter. already look what has happened already and it's it's been less than two hours since he got out of bed yeah but i actually feel like the the confusion that you have reading this the first time it's it's well mm-hmm. done like it's intentional because it's it's wolf trying to make you feel as confused as severian probably yeah. oh is. man this is so action-packed it's so fast-paced yeah and then, so the next chapter will actually, we, he won't know it yet, but we'll, we'll finally have the claw with us. Right. So as usual, questions or concerns or just things that we got totally wrong, please feel free to let us know. Let us know on the Facebook page, Rereading Wolf Podcast Facebook group. And get us on Twitter at Reading Reading Wolf at Rereading Wolf, um, and then Rereading Wolf at gmail.com. If you're not into social media but still want to send us some notes, we love to do that, and we'll definitely go back and forth on email too. So if you're if you want to chat about some of this but just don't necessarily want to do it publicly, we're happy to write back and forth there too. That's right. This uh, this thing really doesn't work without your questions, comments, and complaints. So we really, really appreciate them. Craig and I have read this book over and over and around and gone round and around. We've gone through all the theories and, you know, without you guys, that's all we would be doing. Absolutely. And one thing we're half-ish through Shadow of the Torture. Are we? Are we, that, are we close? Let me say. We're approaching. Well, maybe we're we getting, are half or something. We're getting yeah, At least there. we've, we've <laughs> got Severian out of the tower. But I think we would both probably really like feedback just on things that are working about the show and things that aren't. Like if there's something yeah. that you feel like we could do differently, if there's something, just even a small thing that you feel like is, is irritating <laughs> or something <laughs> that makes it hard to listen to, let us know uh, because we'd like feedback. We really do. We have a blast doing it, but we also want to make sure that it's something fun to listen to. And right, exactly. When you spent so much time talking about this, you you know, and we're we're kind of in the weeds of doing it. So having other people tell us, you know, what parts seem to work for them and what don't would really help. So that would be some great feedback. Well, so next time, what is our chapter next time? The destruction of the altar. Oh wow, the destruction of the altar. He's going to get the claw, but he's not yeah. going to know for a long time. Yeah, a chapter. I admit, I thoroughly misunderstood the first time I read it. what oh i can't wait to talk about that one (laughs) all right well good well every place that we mention rereading wolf at gmail.com or the facebook page or reddit or twitter we would love to hear from you thank you so much thank you very much she's gonna hand you a red-headed gabriel coming from the bar in a plastic tie He's gonna swing from the tree of life He's gonna try to sell you on a great big lie But when you speak to her, her eyes light up The music spills right into your cup The minstrels play and the waitress brings ice There are pies on a carousel, half its life But watch out, she ain't no good for you 
she's gonna spin like the tractor pull she'll sit back when he tells his tale he's gonna yell when he drinks his beer she'll sit back and drink ginger ale but when you speak to her her eyes light up the music spills right into your cup it's so abrupt and it's so concise there are pies on a carousel have a slice but watch she ain't no good for you I say watch out She ain't no good for you The slender figure and delicate features that seemed incongruent to him I'm sorry <coughs> <laughs> Yeah, and so there's another one um, Lee Bourbon who we've talked about before, um, but back on the earth list. Wait, I'm curious. When was it? Oh, back in oh, 20. Lee Berman. Is that what I said? I, what did I say? What did I say? Lee Bourbon. Oh, Bourbon. <laughs> <No, laughs> we'll start over. 